used to that in, in a lot of ways. So the other thing is just the casual conversations you can have before or after. There's no replacing that either. So all else being equal, it still is good to be there in person. And uh, Shane, while we're waiting for this to load up, I do want to expound on, on that a little bit. Uh, as our chief lobbyist uh, that is down in Bismarck, uh, you'd mentioned the, the side conversations that take place, and uh, it's been on numerous occasions. It's been on numerous occasions while um, different bills are being considered and even amended and revamped uh, that some of the leadership that is uh, outside of the Minot representation has reached out directly to Shane to get in contact with myself, to get in contact with staff or, uh, or whichever avenue is needed uh, for essentially further direct communication or for a very quick meeting that they want to have down at the Capitol. So right. it's been instrumental to um, have Mr. Gettle in the hallways to be able to have our eyes and ears and interests at hand and uh, be able to facilitate that. So. With that, our technology has caught up. Here we go. <laughs> All right, uh, so we are one month into the session. The session began January 5th, and so we're just a little bit beyond that. There's 503 wow. bills and 33 resolutions in the House. In the Senate, there's 304 bills and 13 resolutions. For the city, I am tracking and monitoring a, uh, a little over 150 bills and resolutions. We're not gonna talk about all those tonight. We're only gonna talk about those that we've decided to weigh in on uh, in one way or the other. Uh, but these bills cover all sorts of things. You can see the list there, um, you know, every every aspect of, of city governance and, and uh, responsibility is touched by one bill or another. So what do I do? I'm at the Capitol every day. Um, I do some of the analysis of the bills and resolutions and uh, daily we're executing on our strategy, particularly with those things that are our most important. We've prioritized, for example, flood protection and NOS, and uh, almost a, not a day goes by without me talking to somebody about where we're at with that. Uh, there's daily coordination every week. There's there's uh, drafting of testimony, review and submission of written oral testimony that I'm coordinating with city officials, and then uh, the frequent consulting and the private meetings with key legislators. Uh, I attend or monitor the hearings. And uh, also, and this is really important too, I coordinate with other cities and the League of Cities. And uh, that's, that's critical too, so that they know when we're coming to testify, and there are times in which we're asked to say, you know, could mine in particular weigh in on this, on this topic? And so we, uh, we work, work on that too. Um, I've divided this presentation this evening into various topics. I thought that might be the best way to organize the material. And so uh, I mentioned the priorities and that's where I'd really like to start tonight. So the big idea of this session is bonding for essential infrastructure. And uh, that leads to the funding for flood protection. In the past, we've been funded entirely out of what comes into the Natural Resources Trust Fund from extraction tax on oil. There's no other place that that money comes from. This time around, uh, the idea is to bond for large scale projects like Minot flood protection, uh, like uh, the Fargo diversion, like Red River water supply, uh, and, um, and do that for these big water projects. So there are several bonding bills, but the one that contains, you know, we, we, we've testified on the State Water Commission budget, that's, uh, that's House Bill 1020, that's in white there. And we've also testified on House Bill 1431, because 1431 contains right now the funding for flood protection. And so I'll get into that. There's some other legacy bills which we're tracking here, uh, but we didn't testify on these. If there's good ideas in these, I can tell you that they're gonna be rolled into House Bill 1431. And the reason I say that is because you've got the majority party uh, who's got their majority leaders on that bill. And so that's, that's just the way it's going to unfold. So 1020 is the uh, Water Commission budget, and uh, we uh, we took the strategy here, in particular on the uh, on flood protection, of having uh, the mayor uh, co-testify, along with the Surish River Joint Board Chair David Ashley, in favor of the Mouse River enhanced uh, flood protection. That hearing was on January 11th, early in the session, and uh, with our current funding trajectory, if we just kind of keep pace with where we've been and, and continued on that trajectory. The, the, the project would com be complete in 2041. So that's another 20 years 
of, uh, of funding out there. So what we attempted to do in this session is start a conversation to switch the emphasis from what has been legislative intent to get to milestone number one inside the city limits of Minot. Milestone number one being that point at which 62% of those impacted areas within the city limits would be protected. Uh, because that's been the intent since 2017, it has been misunderstood by some as being an endpoint rather than simply a milestone. And we've had to be, you know, tried to do some education and I think we finally got to that. But we're not completely there. There was 193 million that was set up from 2017 to 2025 to be funded within the city limits of Minot to take care of that milestone. It was thought back in 2017 that that kind of milestone would be something that can fire the imaginations and support of, of the legislature. And so we've been going with that. But now we're nearing the end of it. And we're kind of finding a need to change the conversation and look at the whole project. And so that's what we did. We, we, we presented the committee with, well, here's what it would take if we could really get into gear and do it in seven years. Now, we also admitted that that would be really difficult to keep up with in terms of local match, right? So we think 10 year and 20 year and uh, maybe something uh, more uh, modest like a 12 year or 13 or 15 year plan or something along those lines. We just wanted to start that conversation and get, get them over that hurdle. They still seem to be sort of intent on trying to meet that original legislative intent. And so honestly, we've started to communicate, you know, we're willing to, to, to shift that legislative intent to, to the entire project and what it would take to get the whole thing done. So uh, that's where we're at. Um, we'll see how that proceeds. Um, and then in addition, of course, during that hearing, uh, we provided testimony in support of NAS funding as well. Status of that as it remains in committee, it's going to stay there until we see what happens with the bonding bill, which I predict will go first. And then uh, uh, because that's going to impact how the water budget is approached. If they don't have to reach inside the Natural Resources Trust Fund to fund uh, our, our Mouse River enhanced flood protection, that's a big deal and uh, can make a big impact on other things they'll program those water funds for. So I, I guess we can have a dialogue in any of this as we go along. So if somebody you know, wants to start asking questions, you, you can before I move on to the next uh, slide. And thank you, Shane. If anybody does have any questions, you can just give a, give a signal and we'll pause there and take questions too. Alderman Patagula. Um, <coughs> In terms of the reluctance to dip into that fund, do you think, to the extent that you can speak freely in public, do you think that's a more of a philosophical or theoretical stance, or do you think that's some sort of a, quote, political, close quote, maneuver to try to get something else? The thing that comes to mind right away is the perennial, uh, I don't want to say conflict, but the perennial tension between the East and the West and the the incredibly burgeoning costs of the of the Fargo uh, protection programs. Here's what's uh, um, it, it's less that honestly. Okay. Um, it's uh, it's more about the fact that the Natural Resources Trust Fund, because oil production has been down and prices were depressed for a while, is not getting the resources that it was expected to, and there's some concern that that might be carried forward in the next biennium. So it's really alternative three, a pragmatic one. The money's it's not there. It's a pragmatic one, and it's pushing out smaller water projects for, for, for rural areas, water towers, things like that, when you have you know, big projects like Fargo right. Diversion and Minot, uh, flood protection for Mouse River and uh, taking up a good chunk of those resources. So the idea is, look, bonding rates are so low, why don't we take take advantage of those of the next biennium and fund uh, what we need to for these two big projects and other projects as well and free up some of the resources that are in there for other smaller projects. That's really what's going on. So it's a rational I think it is. Yep. decision. Yep. Thank I you. Think that is. really helps. And then I can move pretty swiftly here right into the bonding bill. That's House Bill 1431. So the idea here is that for the state share of the Mouse River Enhanced Flood Protection for the next biennium, the state would bond. And that the debt service on that bond would be repaid with uh, legacy fund earnings. So now we're using a legacy fund for large scale infrastructure to extend our capabilities as a state to reach these large projects. I think that's a good policy move, we're supporting it. And uh, it's, going to, it's going to pass. And the question is how much bonding would we do for other things besides this? But I think we're in really good shape 
with, uh, with this as, uh, is really one of the top priorities for bonding. Uh, we testified on this, both uh, the mayor and uh, uh, Search River Joint Board Chair David Ashley, and the funding in this is $74.5 million for the Mouse River Enhanced Flood Protection for the next biennium. So that would be what would be available. That keeps us still on a 20-year uh, timetable because there's $30 million in here that we turned back from the last biennium that we're getting back now. Uh, but so this just keeps pace. This is not uh, this is not advancing the project yet beyond that. And then of course Mayor Sipma also testified in support of nine million for a CTE program in Minot, which is also in this in, in this particular bonding bill. Uh, this remains in committee and is still subject to all of those uh, conversations, both in and outside the committee that you've that you've heard about. Shane, let's pause there for just a moment as one of the questions or I, I think uh, ongoing conversations that we had leading into this legislative session was long-term low interest funding uh, in our purview for local cost share for flood control. Now there is a mechanism inside 1431 that does have longer term low interest borrowing for some local cost share or local projects, but f uh, major projects like flood control is not included within the description that's currently in that bill. Um, we've had this conversation with a few people and the appetite as we've understood isn't quite there to really open up that avenue just yet. So uh, we've shared that conversation with a lot of legislators down there that this is something that we're not only going to need but Fargo is going to need and other municipalities are going to need. Uh, it's just really, uh, this is the first session where I think bonding has, has taken a positive uh, traction aspect uh, moving forward. I think that's true To There's some uh, thoughts of do it using bonds to plus up that revolving infrastructure loan fund. We'll see some of that being done this session. But to bond for the state share is a big step forward. And for, you know maybe behind that comes the idea of bonding for local shares as well using using the state's credit so that uh, you're not as impacted by that long-term bonding. But we know that that's going to be a problem over time. Right now, bonds in the market are, are attractive, but long-term, uh, the debt load that you will need to amass in order to take care of the local share is a concern that we've gotta be talking to policymakers about. Even if we don't do something about it this session, we're seeding the ground to, uh, to begin that conversation later. So we are watching that design of the program, how the interest rates will work. There's an escalator clause in there right now that uh, I don't think makes it attractive to a lot of cities. I don't know if that'll stay, but uh, there's some pushback against that. We'll see. Okay, any further on this one? Okay, then we'll get into uh, Northwest Area Water Supply. I mentioned that we've testified in support of the funding for that in the Water Commission budget. There's one other bill though that is important to this, and that's uh, House Bill 1063. That started with the idea of updating the service areas. There were, there were um, some service areas in there that included Williams uh, County, Divide, or uh, Williston, Div Divide County, the tribe that are not going to be part of NAS, but it was old, outdated language. That will be updated at the very least. At the same time, it kicked off a discussion about uh, how do we transition uh, ultimately and who will own and uh, who will take care of the operations and management of the various pieces of NAS. We've made it very clear that Minot, of course, is going to control the, uh, the, the well, we need to control water treatment. The, the water treatment facility and then coordinate that with the new facility, the bio treatment facility that we built at Max. And so that's been our messaging in this, no matter what happens. I'm not quite sure what, what'll happen here yet. We went from, well, we should jump to the authority. I think we kind of message back, we're not ready for that authority yet, uh, but there does need to be some transition. And whether that mission of transition is given to this advisory, current advisory committee or if something new is established is yet to be determined. We're really in the midst of those conversations right now. So this bill remains in, remains in committee. Any questions on that? Okay, um, and then the uh, other concept, and I don't think Jonathan is here this evening, but uh, he came down and testified on uh, this idea of neighborhood zones. 
neighborhood zones, just think Renaissance zones, and now apply them to, to residential areas that are in need of uh, substantial investment uh, and uh, some, some tax breaks, et cetera, in order to incent the redevelopment of those neighborhoods, just like we use Renaissance zones for across the state. This would extend that idea to neighborhood zones, and it's modeled completely after the Renaissance. In fact, it, right now it's, it's proposed inside the Renaissance zone chapter, just adding neighborhood zones. So that hearing was on February 4th, just last week. Uh, Jonathan Rosenthal came down to testify, and that remains in committee. Um, it's, the idea originated in Fargo. Uh, it's caught on with some, some statewide support. League of Cities was in to support it as well. And, uh, but I'll say that one of, the, one of the sponsors on the bill, I believe, was Senator Judy Lee, and I, she did say this. She said, sometimes ideas need a session or two to catch on, which, you know, maybe, we'll see. We'll see what happens with this in committee. But it's a, it's a new concept, and, and it might, might take a while for people to wrap their heads around it. But we are supporting it. And then I've lumped together um, all of those uh, bills that uh, end up providing some sort of restriction on local control of property taxes in one way, shape, or form. Uh, and I'll just walk through. These are all the ones that uh, somebody from the city of Minot has uh, testified to. First one I'll mention is House Bill 1200. That would put a, a limit on property tax levied by uh, a taxing district, in this case a city, without voter approval. The hearing on this was January 20th. Uh, Harold, uh, came, Harold Stewart came down and testified in opposition. This was defeated on the House floor on January 22nd. You can see a real um, lopsided vote there. House Bill 1192 would have limited the property value assessments and also property tax levies. This was heard on January 22nd in House Political Subdivisions and David Lakefield testified in opposition. This was defeated on the floor on January 28th. And again, a pretty, uh, pretty uh, comprehensive lopsided uh, vote there uh, on that bill. Next bill is, uh, um, that should be Senate bill, sorry, not House bill, Senate bill 2270. Uh, this provided for a property tax reduction for individuals over 65 years of age. Now there's other bills that are similar approaching our elderly and their property tax burden. This one in particular though, the way it was constructed was, was not favored by the Senate Committee, the Senate Finance and Tax Committee. Uh, Harold Stewart submitted written testimony in opposition. Uh, this was defeated on January 29th and a pretty strong uh, vote against it on the Senate floor, 39 to seven. Again, I apologize, I should have changed the House bills, the Senate bills up there, my error in putting this together. I think the easy way to remember this, if it's got a two in front of it, it's Senate. It's a, it's one a Senate House. bill if it's got a two, it's a House bill if it's got a one. Senate Bill 2326, that was to create a voucher process for overassessed property. So if your property had been overassessed, you get a tax voucher back. <coughs> um, this was heard on February 3rd. David Lakefield testified in opposition, defeated on February 4th. So it didn't take long to come out of committee. And you'll see the Senate floor vote was very strong against that, 46 to 1. <coughs> House Bill 1372. Uh, would freeze, provide a freeze on assessed value in certain situations for people who are disabled or uh, for disabled veteran credits or over the age of 65. Heard on January 27th, Harold Stewart uh, submitted uh, testimony uh, in written in opposition. February 3rd, it received a do not pass out of the committee nine to four to one. Um, House Bill 1325, again, this is another one, providing a property tax freeze for residential property owned and occupied by an individual over 65. Uh, hearing was January 19th. Uh, City Manager Harold Stewart testified in opposition. This was amended into a study concerning the adequacy of property tax relief for retired individuals. So this is what they ended up doing with all of these bills that were trying to deal with property tax burden for, for our elderly population. Uh, this study passed on January 28th overwhelmingly on the House floor. So that ended up being the overall strategy then to, to move these, that issue of, uh, of uh, dealing with uh, those age 65 and older and their property tax burden. And so Shane, we'll see a study next, uh, probably during the interim. 
and if we can pause for just a moment on this and for uh, folks either listening or watching or um, here at the dais, a lot of the bills that we just saw um, had some basic language on there and uh, most of the concern that we had heard even from legislators in asking questions is there was no idea or implication of fiscal impact to communities based on this and that's really where the study evolved to yep. just for kind of a broad overview. Uh, House Bill 1446 that would provide property tax credits using legacy fund earnings. The hearing on that was February 2nd. Uh, David Lakefield submitted written testimony in opposition. That remains in committee. This is a, a new concept. A lot of times these property tax bills, we've seen them before and they come back every session in one form or another. This is a new, new concept or new idea. Uh, House Bill 1300 relates to special assessment fund balances. We did, this bill came up last year as well. And um, um, Harold Stewart testified in opposition, but this ended up passing the House floor 80 to, 80 to 12. Um, here, the idea is if, if you've had specials and you've paid off the uh, improvements that those specials were set for, and there's some fund balances left that those should be given back to the people who paid in. But there's some real practical problems that we highlighted for the committee about doing that because you know people <laughs> handle their specials in various ways, and you have transfers of home ownership, and uh, some people paid them off uh, early. Some people you know made their regular payments through time, and uh, you get a whole hodgepodge of of various things that people have done. So this is really you know quite difficult in the end to manage and uh, can create some inequities. So uh, that's at least part of the basis that, uh, that the, but the committee, uh, you know, that got, got a strong floor vote. And so we'll have to, this will go on to the Senate now. We'll have to make those arguments there. All right, uh, before I move from that whole topic of property tax bills and restrictions, any, there are other bills, but these are the ones that we, that we weighed in on. Any questions? Okay. Okay. Um, and then there's a whole host of bills that deal with COVID and emergency situations and the authority of the governor and authority of local officials. I'm highlighting a couple of them here that we weighed in on. Um, first is a continuing res House uh, 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 resolution 3007. This resolution would have terminated the state of emergency that was declared by Governor Burgum back on March 13th in response to COVID-19. Uh, the hearing was on January 19th. Uh, Mayor Sipma testified in opposition. Uh, when we're dealing with resolutions, uh, we use the language failed to adopt. So the House failed to adopt this resolution on February 5th. You can see the vote there. Uh, and the predominant rationale behind not doing this is that uh, there are federal funds that are associated with the state of emergency. And to, to simply call that off without some planning, et cetera, could put some of that funding in jeopardy. That's one of the reasons. Uh, and uh, Another one uh, tied very closely to this and we, we couldn't find an answer to is uh, other situations as the vaccination process continues. And then HB 1260, uh, this would, this as originally proposed, it would have put a uh, wage and salary moratorium on state or local officials and employees if certain temporary restrictions on business are opposed. So if you shut down a business because of an emergency, if you restrict their hours, et cetera, then uh, you'd go without a salary uh, if you're in one of the uh, identified positions in the bill. The hearing was in January 20th. Mayor Sitma testified in opposition. And then the committee reported it back, do not pass. You see the strong committee vote there, 13, dash, or 13 to one to zero. Uh, that was amended though, uh, before they gave it that do not pass. It was amended to delete employees, but then uh, the language applied it to the governor and members of the legislature, and then applied to every city commissioner and then mayor or city manager. Now mine it is, I think, the only city with a city manager with that designation so that this really singles out 
singles out Minot and uh, particularly Harold. <laughs> um, but uh, it got re-referred back to IBL after that committee vote, and that's where it sits right now. So I don't know what what uh, what's going to happen with this with this bill at this point. It, uh, it's it's unusual that it got re-referred after it was. Uh, amended with that uh, do not pass vote. So we'll, we're watching it closely to see what the committee uh, decides to do with it. One of the other uh, changes within the amendment, the uh, uh, level of salary and uh, salary was actually removed as well. The original language had $125,000, anything that or above. Um, so that was stricken out of there. So it just reads salary now or uh, or income, period. And I would say the prime argument against this is, is, is one that I think everybody can think of. In a state of emergency, your key personnel that are making $125,000, the ones you need, would suddenly go without a salary and, uh, during, during those conditions. Uh, we brought up the, the, Minot, uh, the flood in Minot as an example of, of that and how long that state of emergency lasted. And you don't want your, your best officials uh, struggling with how they're going to you know, feed their families during a state of emergency. Well, along with that, according to federal law, I don't know how you can uh, require someone to work without being compensated. Yeah. So it's not that you're making them have a financial burden. It's you're effectively kicking them off the job in your time of greatest need and emergency. And in my pocket, I have uh, the opinion uh, authored by uh, the city, city attorney hear about the contracts aspect of this as well. All right, so those are just a couple of the bills. There are, there are several others, but uh, those are the ones that we weighed in on. Uh, another category of bills, and I, I characterize these as uh, opposition to dramatic changes to city elections. Uh, first, uh, House Bill 1182 would allow the option to designate a political party on school, county, and city elections. Uh, that was heard in, in uh, January 21st in front of House Government Veterans Affairs. Both uh, city council members, Lisa Olson and Carrie Evans, test provided written testimony in opposition. On February 1st, this was reported back with a due pass. And that was actually voted on? Today. Late today. Yep, bef after I prepared this. Uh, <laughs> And for those uh, who haven't uh, been able to check their email, that did fail um, quite substantially. And um, I believe all but one Minot representative voted in favor of that with one that was absent, just for our knowledge. Um, House Bill 1165 would allow qualified electors in the extraterritorial zone. So if, a, if somebody is eligible to vote in a general election and they live in the extraterritorial zone, they would be able to vote in city elections. That's what this bill proposes. That was heard in February 4th in, in House political subdivisions, and uh, Council Member Kerry Evans testified in opposition, and that remains in committee at this time. Anything else on elections before we move on to the next topic? Okay. Then I've grouped a series of bills that uh, Minot uh, officials have uh, weighed in on regarding restrictions on city governance. Uh, this, these are kind of all over the map now uh, under this category. So House Bill 1169 would have provided a petition process for complaints whenever somebody deemed the city or other kinds of political subdivisions uh, we're in competition with the private uh, private industry. This was heard on January 26th. Uh, city Manager Harold Stewart. I think I've spelled your name uh, with a D <laughs> and a T throughout this. Uh, sorry about that. Um, provided. I'm sorry. I was trying to get this done before the uh, before the uh, Super Bowl. <laughs> uh, that was defeated on Jan uh, on February. So that should be February 2nd. Uh, House floor vote of uh, nine to 85. And then uh, House Bill 1138 would have allowed civil action, would allow civil actions against the state and political subdivisions for violating free speech. Uh, this one's, a, I, I don't know how um, uh, this can really, can really work because it would, in my view, allow someone to sort of filibuster a meeting, a member of the public. And, you know, for those legislators who are hearing people all the time testify in front of hearings, can't imagine they'd tolerate a filibuster there. So 
Um, this was heard on January 20th, the House Judiciary, the mayor testified in opposition. On February 4th, it did get a do not pass, a pretty strong one there. Senate Bill 2188 relates the authority to regulate the sale of consumer merchandise. That was heard on January 21st in Senate political subdivisions. And Brian Billingsley uh, submitted written testimony in opposition. February 5th, I got a 7-0 do not pass recommendation. And uh, I don't know if it hit the Senate floor today or not. I was watching the House instead of the Senate proceedings, so. It did, uh, I'm getting a thumbs down from Brian, so it, uh, yeah. it did hit the Senate, but did not pass. Okay. Did not pass. Yeah. Did not pass. Okay. And Brian also uh, emailed, uh, um, I think, some of our uh, minded uh, representatives about that bill before it hit the floor as well. Um, HB 1222 relates to non conforming structures that was heard on January 28th, House Political Subdivisions. Uh, and then uh, Brian Billingsley testified in opposition to that too. And this one remains in, in committee yet. House Bill 1443 relates to the duty of Peace Officer Standards and Training Board to provide training on bias crimes, aggravated assault, harassment, and criminal mischief. Uh, the hearing on that was today. And Chief of Police John Klug submitted testimony in opposition of the bill as written but indicated in his testimony that he could support it with amendments and had some suggestions. So the hearing uh, was held today and uh, we'll see what the committee does with it. House Bill 1367 relates to uh, the adoption and referral of preliminary budgets of cities. And you can guess that, uh, that maybe the city of Minot might wanna weigh in on this. Uh, so we are, uh, I'm working with this is one example of a bill in progress for this week that uh, I think uh, we're preparing some testimony for, I believe this is on Thursday, if my memory serves. And so that's coming up. For a brief overview on that one, uh, Shane, if I recall, um, essentially this and similar bills um, in many circumstances could create the need for special elections or uh, some of the other bills as well would push up the budget timing uh, essentially into July. Uh, and as you can imagine with the election cycle being what it is, if a uh, new council is seated or new members are seated at the end of June and staff having to have essentially a finished um, budget by the time that uh, by the time that that new council seat it creates let's let's be honest challenges there so a lot of these uh, I, I think m may have good intentions but practicality with some of them just are not realistic to the budget cycles that are out there within the timelines that we're already working in that have been shortened up even uh, in the last uh, two biennial okay then uh and we continue to monitor about 150 bills uh, and resolutions that are that are out there. Um, a couple, well, one other big one that I do want to mention that the city itself didn't weigh in on, but but really is an important project for all of you to be aware of, and that is that uh, Senator Karen Krebsbaugh did uh, put in a bill to secure 10 million dollars for um, the uh, Minot EDC to use to do two things. One, to acquire the assets that were foreclosed upon uh, at the intermodal facility. You know, the city owns the land, but the improvements were, were pledged as collateral by the previous operator, and those, that, that whole thing was foreclosed upon. And so this would provide a sum of, sum of money that would be used to uh, secure those assets back from the financial institutions that currently hold them and then also provide funds to lay track into Gavin Yards. Because right now when a unit train is loaded, and their unit trains have been loaded out there now since October, and it's going well. Uh, but uh, but they're, they're being uh, divided up and then have to sit on the main track line. And if that situation persists beyond August 1st, it puts into jeopardy the provisional permission that BNSF has given for this operation. It's only provisional until August 1st. 
And so that provisional thing, it, there's some expectations that go along with it that this, this site can be prepped for full operations. And so we need to clear the, uh, the title issues out there on the improvements and we need to get uh, track laid into Gavin Yards to allow one full unit train to be loaded without putting part of it on the main, main line at any time. And so that bill is really important to the city. Uh, it had strong support from this community, but the city didn't uh, testify on it. So it, it didn't make my list here, but I did want to mention it tonight. Okay. There were uh, a, a couple of uh, members of the community that did go down, uh, J Mr. McMartin, I believe, and yes. uh, members of the community that testified on that as well. And the last piece um, is the, the request from BNSF as well to have that connectivity within Gavin Yards. Um, so they've, they've kind of thrown their blessing. Uh, Alderman Janser, you do you know what bill number that is? Or is, do you have that? Um, I'll be able, to, yeah, I can provide it real well, quick. Or, you know, if you I, give me I just can dig a it up too, it is that. <clears throat> yeah. It's uh, Senate Bill 2245. Thank you. So that is right now in Senate appropriations. Um, both uh, Senator Krebsbaugh and Senator Hogue sit on, uh, sit on that committee. I think we've got, uh, my judgment, some really strong support from the Minot delegation on, on that bill. All right, um, that's the end of my presentation. And we can certainly uh, dialogue on any of the issues that are, that are in the session, so. Thank you, Shane. I appreciate it. Uh, questions on any of the bills or any of the proposals that uh, are outstanding right now or the process? Maybe, um, well, I'll, I'll ask that first. And if there isn't, I've got another couple of questions that you can kind of lead us down uh, what's next. Perhaps on any of the bills that have been outlined, is there any that um, we need to have discussion as different direction? Um, from what has been taken and moved upon at this point. If not, Shane, if you can, so we've still, we're still pre-crossover. We are. Uh, yeah. For our sake, for the public's sake, um, take us down the road a little bit into crossover, what that means, and then really how these bills transition uh, as those that do pass that we're still watching or maybe have a different opinion on uh, than how they passed or, or otherwise um, on how that process works. So uh, you'll see any, uh, any particular route. So all the bills so far uh, have been um, in the chambers in which they were introduced and have had hearings in the chambers in which they were introduced. If they're defeated in that chamber, then we're done with that bill. It's not impossible for the ideas that were in that bill to find their way into another bill. That happens quite frequently. But, but if a bill is defeated, it's, it's uh, that bill with its bill numbers done for the session. For those bills that pass the chamber, at the end of this month, um, uh, they will um, be taken up in March now in the, in the opposite chamber. So crossover is occurring right at the end of February, and then they take a, a couple days off, they close the session on a Friday and recess until the following Wednesday. So they take a long, long weekend in there and then, uh, and then they end up, uh, when they come back, taking up the bills that, that came to them from the other chamber. So the, the number of bills gets whittled down you know, quite a bit between, uh, between now and the end of the month. And then, uh, of course, all the budget bills survive in one form or another. And uh, then they repeat the process. We have hearings sometimes in the policy committees first and uh, when I say first, that's because um, if it's going to have a, an impact on the state budget, it then can often get re referred to appropriations for another hearing, not on the policy, but on the, uh, on the amounts and where that fits in the budget. And then that budget committee, uh, the appropriations committee will, will make a recommendation as well. Sometimes you have two different sets of recommendations coming in, one from the policy committee and one from appropriations before it finally gets its final action on the floor. I think North Dakota is unique in that sense of every bill gets a hearing and every bill gets a vote. Some states, uh, they can be pocketed in committees and you never see them again. They never get to the floor. 
and in that sense, it can be defeated in a committee. And chair, chair, the chairman of those committees have a lot of power to sort of pocket uh, bills that they don't like. We don't have that system in North Dakota. Our committees, the power they have is to hear it and then issue a recommendation of do pass or do not pass. Um, occasionally, you see a bill where the prime sponsors decide to back off and they'll withdraw it, and uh, that can still happen. Uh, it can come back to the floor for the purposes of being withdrawn and so that it doesn't, uh, doesn't continue through the process at all. But um, um, as we wind up, the hearings now will slow down. We can already see that this week, uh, that the hearing schedule has is, is gotten less, but the committee work uh, picks up. Now, that, now they finally start really taking up the bills that have been heard that they've been sitting on for a while and decide what they want to do with them. Uh, and uh, you'll notice the agenda, for example, in the House floor has really over, well over 100 bills on it. And they just take up now what they can get done in the allotted time that they have. In the meantime, the committees keep feeding them additional bills. So they've got a lot of bills to process. The first half of the session is busier because there's more bills. Second half of the session, we don't have to deal with the, uh, with the defeated bills anymore. And uh, both chambers end up, I think, in many respects, taking a deeper dive into the issues. And so just because a bill has passed one chamber does not guarantee that it uh, at all. It doesn't often very, I, don't, I wouldn't predict it's how it, some of them would fare in the, in the other chamber sometimes um, because it's a completely different dynamic. And that's you know, part of the advantages, I suppose, of having bicameral legislatures is that you have, you have two different groups. You don't get into group think on one particular bill because you've got another group that's going to uh, to take a look at it as well. Thank you, Shane. Uh, one of the uh, the points that you made, and I just want to reemphasize that, is uh, keeping an eye on all of the bills and the different amendments that are uh, the bills that are still moving forward, and the amendments that are introduced on those uh, are just as important because uh, one of the bills that you know may have been unfavorable and that we weren't. Uh, that we've you know, testified that uh, we were in opposition. Some of those principles may be offered up as an amendment into, uh, into another bill, uh, and the same ramifications can happen. So that's uh, really the importance of just kind of not uh, hitting the pace of or, or backing down uh, when we're watching these bills move uh, into crossover and beyond. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where we're just staying vigilant with uh, quite a few of these that do have some very limiting factors, or they can have some real uh, adverse effects uh, within the municipal government itself. So um, it's one thing that uh, kind of taken a whole new meeting uh, with a lot of these different bills, at, at least from my purview this session. Um, for Council's uh, understanding as well, every Friday at 2 o'clock, the North Dakota League of Cities has their overview. We've mentioned that before. That is something that anybody can go to their website and log, uh, just basically hit the link and watch. Um, we, uh, and I say we as in uh, Mr. Gettle, myself, and the, uh, the city manager, and quite a bit of the staff, as I see who logs in, uh, not only watches that, uh, but then Mr. Gettle, um, Mr. Stewart, and myself uh, have a planning meeting directly after that, either four or five o'clock on a Friday afternoon, to discuss which are the pertinent bills that are going to be coming up for the for the week ahead and whether it's Friday or Monday or I'm sorry Monday or Tuesday uh, we've got essentially the weekend to draft testimony and kind of draw that plan up and that's where uh, a couple of the aldermen have seen requests coming in for testimony on a Saturday or Sunday for the for the week ahead um, and staff has done a, a great job as well uh, picking up a lot of that uh, sh let's call it short notice need for testimony and uh, greatly appreciate that. Uh, one other aspect that Mr. Gettle has uh, been critical uh, within that direct conversation that we had with uh, Representative Nelson, who I'd been down the day before on January 20th testifying, uh, running to him out in the hallway uh, as Mr. Gettle had given me a, a advance notice that um, he wanted a meeting the very next day to talk about some the very significant impacts of NAWS in that ownership or transition, uh, to which then... Um, uh, public Works Director uh, Dan and uh, our Assistant Public Works Director Jason came down uh, to Bismarck with me and we had a couple of hour long discussion about what that was all going to look like and I, I think it was exceptionally beneficial to sit down and have those and we've been called down a couple of other times for discussion. So um, 
there's definitely a, a significant amount of uh, work that is going on behind the scenes and not just um, from Shane and I, but staff as well. So we're, we're greatly appreciative of that. Uh, let, let me just say, I think uh, I think everybody's been incredibly responsive. So I want to take this opportunity to s say uh, to the council members that we've engaged on issues and, and especially the, s the staff that uh, it's, it's gone very well so far in terms of getting everything in and on, on time. Absolutely. Alderman Ross. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just a, a question, suggestion, maybe, uh, you know, after the meetings, after your guys' discussion, um, just to get, I, I don't know if there's a short little email, just a kind of a hit list of, of, of what you guys and, and Harold, our city manager, have talked about, just on a weekly basis, um, you know, just to kind of give us an update on, on what you guys are looking at. I think as a council, and I'm not speaking on behalf of the entire council, but as a council, that that would also give us uh, the opportunity to educate ourselves, but also be prepared in case um, we get questions or comments from the public on, on what can be targeted. It could be a, just a weekly little hit list. Here it is, here's the status, here's what we plan to do. Something like that I think would play, uh, would, would go a long ways to uh, helping me myself. Absolutely, Alderman Ross, and that's uh, something I think that could be easily put together. I essentially uh, what what I do, <laughs> and it's about as simplistic as it gets. Uh, going into the hearing schedule, kind of the hit list of what is out on there for the League of Cities, and we touch on whichever uh, item that that is of interest in the coming week. Highlight those who's going to be best responding, which ones we're watching, which ones we're testifying on. Um, that'd be easy enough to send out uh, just for an informational push. So. Uh, we will go ahead and pass that in the, the coming weeks. And um, even for me, it's been uh, daunting to keep up, but uh, these guys have been exceptional on making sure that uh, nothing is overlooked. Alderman Ross. Just as a, just as a follow-up, I, you know, I wrote some notes down and some questions. Shane, uh, you know, I, did, I, I really like your work down there. I'm, I'm really impressed with it. And in your opinion, I mean, you've spent so much time down there and you look at some of these bills and I get comments from, from folks from time to time, but you look at some of these bills and you go, how is it even possible for somebody to write a bill like that expecting it, and I know every bill has a chance of passing, but come on, some of these bills, and, and the ones that kind of stand out are the ones that affecting the only city with the city manager and the city manager's pay. I mean, seriously, how much, how much of this and even stripping or pulling the, 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 the emergency mandate, the state of emergency. How much of this is they really want something like this to pass versus they just want to start a discussion, in your opinion? Sure. Uh, the, I'll use the two examples that you brought up. I think there is a solid contingent at the legislature who wants <laughs> to see the declarations done, and they're serious about it. It's not enough to prevail on the floor, as we've seen. But it's uh, it's a it's a real issue for a lot of people, and I think uh, they hear hear about it from a number of their constituents. So that one I'd say has some 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 realness behind it. <coughs> um, and then you'll see other bills, and I would put uh, you know stripping stripping uh, key employees of their salaries during times of emergency crisis as one in which it's more about ginning up a conversation and making a, a political point than it is about assessing the seriousness of the bill and its chances of passing. So that's that's me being honest here too, so. Thank you. And part of those, uh, Alderman Ross, um, the side conversations that take place after that uh, with different members, as, as I was standing out in the hall, I think waiting for uh, uh, Mr. Stewart to testify uh, regarding that bill specifically and, and helping them understand the way that bill originally came forward, that was any emergency, a snow emergency would have spurred that, uh, flood, fire, you name it, would have spurred that. And that's where, um, you know, some of those hallway conversations uh, really make it impactful uh, as not every legislator, and we've even heard that during our legislative forums that we've had virtually is, um, they've got their committee assignments, so not every legislator is aware of every single bill that is going on. So um, that those hallway conversations do a good job of helping them understand too why we're down there and you know what our stance is on it. And, um, and yeah, 
there are silly bills. I would say that we were spared one that I heard about in Oklahoma. And that's to open up a hunting season for Bigfoot. So, <laughs> <laughs> Mr. City Manager. Yes. So if I if I may speak somewhat philosophically and just based off of experience. So having now North Dakota being the fourth state that I've had the opportunity to serve as a city manager in over the last decade and a half to two decades, I have seen a a concerning trend with a a growing anti-local government sentiment in state legislatures. And we're seeing more and more of these bills. And, and one of the concerning issues is we're seeing more and more state representatives skipping the involvement at the local level, having served on city councils, served as mayor, served on planning and zoning commissions, and they're skipping those aspects and going straight to state legislature. And when they do that, they lose that background and that history of how and why local governments operate the way they do and what their value is. And I think lobbyists and, and other entities have kind of picked up on that as a window of opportunity to really change the future of local government. And uh, that's concerning to me, it's concerning to many within the profession, and it's concerning to many local governments that a lot of these bills, if they go forward, uh, really hamper uh, the ability of local government to survive and be sustainable in the future. And, uh, you know, it's kind of like I mentioned on our on our uh, Facebook interview the other day, the, the mayor and, and with Derek, you know, these property tax bills, while, while we all can probably agree that it would be nice to have less tax burden and pay less, at the end of the day, there's certain services that we have to provide and there's a cost to be able to do that at the level that our constituency asks for. And in reality, a lot of these bills are really targeting, taking away that local control, mandating that by state law. And eventually you're gonna to get to a point, a lot of communities are gonna to get to a point that they just simply can't afford to provide all the services that they do. And you're gonna to have to prioritize down to core services that we provide and everything else is gonna to have to stop. Uh, you know, this is one of the main reasons why I chose to leave Missouri because they had put some of these legislative pieces in place a long time ago. For example, the taxes can't be raised unless it's approved by the voters. Great in concept, impossible to change now, but Missouri is just now starting to pay the consequences of that. When you have infrastructure and services that you can no longer afford to provide, you put it on the ballot for the voters and they say no, we have to present a balanced budget, which means we have to cut services and we have to cut issues and that creates a lot of disputes and discord and anger at the local level because there's services that people want that now the city is no longer wanting to provide. And it's a, it's a very concerning trend. In my opinion, it's a very dangerous trend. And if it persists, it's gonna be very difficult for local governments in North Dakota and across the country to continue to sustain themselves. And, uh, it, and it'll fade out, you know, or reduce down to providing police, fire and streets and <coughs> water and sewer, uh, but everything else is gonna be non-existent. And then eventually, as that gets more and more expensive, uh, those are gonna fade out as well. Those are gonna reduce in the quality of service that we can provide, because we just won't have the money to do it anymore. And uh, again, it's not unique to North Dakota, but it's following a lot of trends that I'm seeing across the country that are very uh, concerning. And uh, this is why it's important that we continue to be vigilant and continue to try and help our state legislators understand the role and value of local government and how those, uh, those ideas and decisions potentially impact, not just today, but later on down the road. Because that's when you're really gonna see it. By the time you see it then, it's gonna be too late. Right. Alderman Patagula. Just kind of building up on that, I, I think we see even core services uh, decimated. Uh, Places like Oregon, where, where counties don't have law enforcement anymore. They have to rely on the state or municipalities don't have law enforcement. Or the disasters that have happened in California because of all the propositions where government's hands are tied. And you know the needs of the people, the desires of the people aren't diminished, they're increased often, and yet the hands are tied. And again, speaking more from my professional standpoint, I mean, it, it seems at some level, there's a real reluctance to face reality. I mean, things cost money, okay? Where are you gonna raise the money? And if you, if you choose one group to favor, that means some other group will be disfavored. And it, it's troubling that, that, you know, it seems like a fair number of people just don't wanna face the reality. 
Uh, that's one reality. The other thing that's troubling to me is the extent to which personal beliefs, ideologies, even religious beliefs are being imposed on people. I have my own personal beliefs, but one of the things that I would try to be very, very careful about is to monitor to what extent I'm letting them seep into my policies. And I have to, in my own mind, decide what's best for the community, not what I might prefer or what might be, you know, some, some group I belong to might prefer. I have to look at what's best for the community. And I think that sense of detachment, that sense of rationality is also being threatened. Just because I want it or because my group wants it doesn't mean that that's the way it should be for everybody. So that's the disturbing part of this too, the, the zealotry, if you will, you know, that, that no government is the best government or the cheapest government is the best government. You know, and, and you have to look, and I'm really glad you're bringing this up, Harold. That's one of the reasons, you know, I, I personally, wanted to see you here, and it's one of the reasons, I, one of the big assets you bring is you bring that perspective from other states, and you can give us a heads up, and being active in your profession, you can tell us what's going on there. Sometimes we tend to get focused on our own issues. But from my perspective, I very much agree with what you're saying, and I also kind of would point out that it's, it's very tempting, it's very seductive to try to remake the world in your own eyes, in, in your own image. And I think if you're in public office, you have to be exceptionally careful about that. And you really have to look at what's best for the community and, and speak for and listen to groups that haven't been heard, groups that haven't been respected, who don't have a voice, who maybe can't get to Bismarck, who don't know the intricacies of the legislative process. And I think you have to have some feeling for that. And regrettably, I, I don't see as much of that as there used to be. I see a lot of good, hard-headed economic reality, and that's I'm, that I'm very pleased about. You know, if the interest rates are so low, it sure makes sense to, to bond out. But, but there are these other things that I also worry about, and I'm, I'm glad you brought them up, Shane. I'm glad you brought them up, Tom. I'm glad, I'm glad you brought them up, uh, Harold, and, and certainly Sean. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's worrisome. One piece, uh, Alderman Podgulan, um probably my last on this session other than uh, thanks, but um, the, the aspect that I think we often look at immediately when we see a bill is fiscal impact and or what is lacking in terms of known fiscal impact on a lot of these bills. And I think that you know, even when staff comes forward with proposals, um, the city manager brings something to council, we have to know what the fiscal impact is either on our budget or the future budget. Um, and that's something that we're not seeing in a lot of these bills. Um, ideas and principles perhaps push forward, but no idea uh, of fiscal impact. And I wanna use the one as an example of the tax break that was for the retired generation, the 65 year and older. And I think a lot of lawmakers are looking for ways to find some sort of fiscal break for the retired generation, rightfully so. Um, there was the question about the homestead tax that's already there. Is it, is it going to be on top of that or replacing it? But really what even kind of uh, spun my attention was a couple of smaller communities that were comprised almost entirely of folks who are 65 years and older and how they could even begin to fiscally plan for anything when 80% of their entire population for the community was that age. So that's one thing that I'm hopeful in the future that we can, uh, and it's kind of key on my, on my point, working with our legislators is what is the fiscal impact of any bills, um, you know, from our local legislators that are moving forward. It's something that I think it, it would be very instrumental in helping us see what's trying to be pushed forward as well, or perhaps move some ideas farther along the line. Um, you know, a, a great idea may be represented uh, or, or pushed forward, maybe not in, in the best of avenues, but maybe there's something better that can be de evolved out of that um, with some fiscal understanding. So um, the last point that I, I do wanna make uh, it, it, to our local legislators is uh, one to say thank you. I've been down there a number of times already. I think I counted seven, if my calendar is anywhere near correct. Um, but they've been really good about sitting down uh, and, and having uh, some good frank uh, discussions. I know uh, I'll use uh, Senator Krebsbach as, as the prime example to sit down and just really kind of, I don't wanna say chew the, the legislative fat, um, but uh, you know, our senators, our representatives, and while I, we may not see eye to eye with all of them on all of the issues, uh, they've been good to at least have those conversations uh, when we're down there. And 
Uh, the final point is February 20th. Uh, we have the Chamber EDC Legislative Forum that is going to be in person uh, out at the State Fair Center, and this would be a good opportunity. This will be the first in-person uh, opportunity to ask questions. If you've been to them in the past, you write your question down on a piece of paper and they have a, a moderator. Um, but it's a great opportunity, I think, for uh, folks to um, you know, socially distance, but I think they've got that all figured out, but to, to be there in person and, and have some good uh, discussions. I know the legislators are also looking forward to that uh, from what they were telling me is there's something lost when it's nothing but uh, virtually and not being able to have those conversations after. Anything final uh, for legislative discussion for the good of the order? Mr. Mayor? Yes, Alderwoman Olson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Say one question that just kind of piggybacks off of what you just said. How can we as a council um, help carry some of this load and what is the best way to be influential with our legislators while they're in Bismarck? Should it be in-person testimony? Should it be um, some of the, the virtual testimony, writing them? What works best? I'll start and then uh, Mr. Gettle can, uh, can either back me up or, or take in a different direction. Um, the great thing, as Shane talked about this session, is the virtual testimony. It gives an opportunity to testimony, testify, to testify remotely. Um, however, we have heard time and time again that the uh, legislators down there, whether it's the Senate or the House, much more prefer the in-person testimony, uh, that direct connection to those different committees and um, the ability for those different committee members to ask questions directly in person. Um, for those folks that directly want to reach out to our local legislators, I would certainly encourage e direct emails uh, as they do have a lot of them, but it's certainly, uh, as I'm told, they go through them every day. And if you have questions of, about a bill or uh, certainly want to just reinforce um, the, the direction that you're encouraging them to take on it, um, that would be, I think, the, at the very least. Um, and to Alder, Woman's po uh, Alder Woman Olson's point, uh, we are going to continue to look for opportunities for for the council, for staff to come down and testify or testify virtually to, I think, further uh, further help the uh, legislature understand uh, the community's uh, point of view on, on some of these bills. Did I miss anything, Shane? No, not at all. I think you hit it there. Uh, the other thing I would say is uh, when uh, uh, the mayor has been down, for example, we have uh, taken the time to stroll through the Senate chamber and the House chamber and just see who you can catch. And I encourage you, if you do come down, to do that. Uh, because I think it also helps to be seen and uh, to have some time for them to uh, dialogue and engage when you're if you come down and see what's going on. Right now, uh, the Capitol's a lot emptier than it's been in past sessions. Uh, I know the legislators are getting a lot more emails and they're finding it more difficult to sort through those than from previous sessions because there's less contact with, with people. And uh, so I think that one-on-one -on -one contact, uh, you can't replace. I, I think it's an important part of the process. Technology is great but, and use it when you can't make the trip, but all else being equal, I think the trip is, 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 is worth the effort uh, when it's possible. So. One, uh, one thing I want to also just say in response to uh, Council Member Patricula's statement too is um, I want to assure you that I, you know, put aside any ideology when I'm representing you. are my client and I, I represent your interests and what, whatever they are in terms of the way you communicate them to me. And so I put my best foot forward on your behalf and I set aside any, any, uh, uh, any personal concerns or wishes that I have because uh, I wouldn't be serving you if I did it any other way. So. One side note, um, too many side notes this evening. Uh, I, I can't help but be a people watcher when I'm down there as well. And we talk about in person and I have taken special notice over the last couple of years. Uh, my first session to this year, I should, I'll correct that, on as people are walking through um, the hallways, they take special note of the name tag on who's there and who's in person, um, whether it's for or against a, 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 a certain bill, but the legislators do take note of who's down uh, representing their community or, or an issue. Um, and, and that carries carries a lot of weight when, when you're stepping forward. The other thing that I keep in mind, and I just offer this as 
some wisdom for you as well is that uh, while you might be opposed to a legislature uh, that you know on one bill, you're gonna need them on another. Mm -hmm. So it's incredibly important to be, when you do have disagreements, not to be disagreeable. I think the word is diplomatic. Yep. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Shane. Uh, any last questions or comments? And I'll look to the I'll look to the phone banks. Nothing from me, Mayor. Again, Shane, uh, this is Paul Pittner here. Thanks for all you do down there. If you ever needed someone to testify, um, you've got my number. You should, or a way to get in touch with me. Um, please feel free to reach out. And outside of this week and maybe next, I'll do my best to uh, be available. Sounds good. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman Pittner. All right, seeing nothing more. Thank you, Mr. Gettle. Appreciate it, and we'll be in touch soon. Actually, uh, probably even later on 1367 to uh, figure out who's going down to testify in person. Uh, that is our only item on the agenda, so uh, I would actually look for item four, adjournment. Uh, we, This being a special session, or a special meeting, rather, we do not need a motion, so all items taken care of, we are adjourned. <laughs>